Our next presenter, a Palestinian social side, will be by Shala Hameo. Hameo. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm honored to be here with this distinguished audience and panel with some of the most intellectuals and activists. I would also like to thank the organizers of the Russell Tribunal in Palestine for inviting me to speak at this international forum. First, let me start with a clarification. My name is Saleh Abdel Jawad. S A L E H A B D A L J A W A D. And not Saleh Hamayel. Hamayel is the clan name of my ancestors. The name was imposed to my family by the Israelis only a few weeks after they occupied the West Bank, including my town, Elbira, in 1967. The anthropologist of the Israeli academia, same time officers in the Israeli army thought that imposing old clanic and tri uh, tribal names will facilitate the identification and control of the population and will renew the and enforce the internal division of the population. Control and division are among the many methods to dominate, dominate Palestinian society. Another clarification, questions, I mean, evoked by especially Mr. William Shapas, about if it is adequate to use a new term. So I will change a little bit in my intervention to say that the use of suicide is essential and so important because we are facing a completely unique situation. The continuous Israeli-Palestinian conflict for more than one century has generated a plethora of literature which covered all aspects of the, this conflict, including precise recordings of power, policies, and human rights abuses. In this library of anguish, relatively few works of uh, provide an accurate theoretical framework for understanding the overall processes of Israeli domination over Palestinians. Behind this library lies an underlying structure which deeper meanings of oppression. In the last 15 years, many terms and concepts appear to describe these policies and to present a framework to understand Israeli colonial, settler, exclusionist system in Palestine. We have the term economic de-development of Sarah Roy, politicide of Baruch Kemmerling, cultural side Omar Baruthi, space side Sari Hanafi, symbolic genocide Leif Grenberg, matrix of control Jeff Halber, Domicide, Alan Jokes, and many who use the term apartheid. But of these many terms, the term apartheid has become the dominant, especially after the building of the separation wall. The subject of terms, let be very clear, 
the subject of terms and concept is not an academic debate. It is a matter of life and death for Palestinian national movement. I would like to emphasize that terminology is of a great importance. Inaccurately framing this is like inaccurately diagnosizing a sick patient and offering the wrong medication. In all cases, the situation of the patient will deteriorate if we diagnose him wrongly and give him the bad medication, and it might possibly lead to death. Therefore, the accurate diagnosis of Israeli policies is essential. I admit that apartheid is a seducing term. First, it's, known, it's a known concept with negative connotations. The moment you say apartheid, the South African case of exploitation and racial, racial segregation comes to mind, comes to mind. The term also, apartheid, can mobilize masses and world public opinion easily. And finally, the term has its roots and existence in international law. The problem is that this concept is not an accurate concept for the situation. It's not accurate or uh, let's say fully accurate to describe what has happened and is currently happening to the Palestinians. As Desmond Tutu said, I don't, maybe I don't need to quote him, but he, I mean he said that we have the same, I can, I notice the same thing what happened in South Africa Moreover, I saw or read about things that did not happen even in the apartheid system. While it is true that there are similarities between South African apartheid system and Israeli policies, there are also many, many differences, which bring me to this uniqueness of the situation. Racial segregation in South Africa between blacks, I'm talking now about similarities. Racial segregation between blacks and whites is similar to the segregation in Palestine between Jews and non-Jews. Moreover, the power dynamics between the superiority of the colonizers are also there. But in the Israeli case, it is far worse because it is a superiority based on religion. Similarly, Israelis control the fertile land, prevent Palestinians from having their civil and political rights, and have created Bantu stands even in the Palestinian case, the Israeli Pantostans are worse because in the Israeli case, the Pantostans is not only to separate between Palestinians and Israelis, but from Palestinians among us themselves. However, there is a big difference on the ground. The blacks in South Africa remained even after a century of white colonization, the majority. Contrary, now the Palestinians on the land on, of Palestine, historical Palestine, they are the minority. Contrary to South Africa, which is the end became isolated and sanctioned by the West, Israel still benefits from special treatment and unique and unconditional support. But the most important difference between us and South Africa is about the objectives 
of the colonizers. In South Africa, the blacks were to be exploited and they are the main labor force, especially in mines and manual jobs. In the Israeli model, inspired by the North American model, the, Arab, the Arabs, like American Indians, were not part of the planned labor force. And you know, whenever a colonial settler situation never used the natives as labor force, their fate was always genocide, total physical extermination. Now, that was not easy to do in the middle of the 20th century. I mean, fortunately for us, the Zionist project came in 1948. It was too late to duplicate what happened for the Indians of North America. Mass media was there. The Convention Against Genocide of 1948 was there. Nuremberg trials were there. Palestinians were part of the Arab world. They were, they could like move our Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, while here the Indians were condemned of being exterminated. To summarize, Palestinian Arabs, like Indians in North America, were not to be by any means part of the new colonial entity. I'm not the first one to state that Israeli policies embody more than the term apartheid. Still, there are people who want to use the concept for different reasons. One of them, because this term is rooted in the international law. Another reason, because they don't have in mind another concept to describe the situation, but some use the term apartheid because in qualifying the system as apartheid, it means that we Palestinians are facing another South African case, meaning that there is a hope to resolve the conflict through one binational state. And I don't think I share with Professor Galton I don't think that the two state solutions were, was feasible since the start. And I also think that the binational one state solution is not feasible. I mean, let's be serious. If the Israelis don't want to give the Palestinians even part of the remaining 22 percent, why they should, because if there will be a binational state, they will give them 50 percent. I mean, uh, yes or no? <laughs> so the question rises, what we are facing and how to accurately describe this situation. I proposed the term sociocide. Sociocide is an analytical concept which I used. The first time I used this concept in my master dissertation presented to Nanterre University, Paris, in 1979. And why I used the term sociocide? Because it was unique. Everybody at that time thought of the 1948 as a war, a victor, and a defeated Palestinians. But for me, something totally different. Not only because 60 to 65 percent of the population became refugees, not only because 80 to 85 
of the Palestinian villages who came under Israeli control totally destroyed, not only because of the 11 cities who occupied by Israel, by Israeli forces in 1948, five were totally depopulated meaning not a single Palestinian remained. This is Majd al-Asqalan, Tibriyad, Tabariya, Bir al-Sabah, Safad. There are another five cities, Jaffa, Haifa, Lod, Ramle, and Akko, Akka. Only few thousands remained. The only intact city in 1948 was Nazareth, because Ben Gurion thought that he will anger the Vatican and the Christian world. And this is why he sent telegraph after telegraph before occupying the city, not to harm the population, not to evict the population, in the third telegraph, actually, he gave the orders to shoot even the looters of the soldiers. But also, if you look to the Palestinian map, you will not believe the extent of ethnic cleansing. If you see this line from Jerusalem, I mean, in the middle of Palestine, this road between Jerusalem and Jaffa, and you go to the south toward Elat, or the, this is the Imr Shrash village, the Palestinian name. Not a single Palestinian village remained. If you take all the coastal plains from Lebanon to Gaza, only two villages remained. Only two. Lefredis and Jusr Zarka. Another thing which make me talk about suicide. None of these destroyed villages was destroyed because of the war. I mean, the houses was so strong, and the Israelis at that time didn't have the firepower to destroy a village. And in many cases, people fled before I mean having a battle. We are not talking about a Bosnian case where there were battles all the time or like in Vietnam. These, all these villages were destroyed after the depopulation and not because of the war. Also we have to take, in, it's not only, let's say, depopulation. All our cultural, written heritage was destroyed or confiscated. Israelis need in 1948 the, our houses even to absorb the immigrants from abroad. But they destroyed the houses because the identity of the landscape must be destroyed. This is why this general phenomenon in 1947 is more than genocide. It's more than you exterminate or you don't exterminate. It's, let's say, all these aspects together which may, which oblige us to search for a new, let's say, definition. Now, in 1986, I presented, so in 1979, I used the term only for 1948 and never use it for the after 1967. In 1986, I presented my PhD, and this is where I use it to describe the ongoing process after 
Um, if you could give us whatever you have left in one minute. Is, uh, give me three minutes. So. Let's do two and a half. We're at the bazaar. Okay. <laughs> okay. The concept. So the concept of suicide denotes the processes that are used for achieving the total destruction of Palestinians, not only as a political national group, this is very important, but also as a society. Its final objective is the expulsion or the uprooting of the Palestinians from their homeland. I use the concept in two different meanings to describe two different historical phases. The first as a result and final product. The second as a long-term process. The first phase came as one stroke, causing a vast destruction of the Palestinian society during the tragic events of the Nakba. The second phase is a gradual and continuous process of Israeli policies and measurements, which is destroying the fabric of the Palestinian society in occupied territories since 1967. As I will detail further on, these two aspects of the concept ascertain the fact that the Nakba is a continuous since 1948, despite the different methods and means. Using sociocide as a concept is also important to describe what happened to Palestine society today to what is going on and happening in Iraq and Syria now. There is a relation between the two cases. At the beginning, when I used the concept, I considered suicide to be less dangerous than genocide, similar to Ilan Pape's position expressed yesterday. Because I consider the later to be association, associated with a massive extermination of people. Later, I thought of the two concepts as equally devastating, since suicide as genocide has, has, have the same objective in common, total or partial destruction of a human group. My third confrontation with this concept came while, as I, while I was reviewing Professor Galton's definition, which crystallized and added to the definition to encompass, in addition to genocide, all concepts mentioned before, like politicide, apartheid, etc. Since I have only, I mean, few, Maybe one minute. No, you, you got your full three minutes. No, no, only one minute, please. <laughs> I just want to say what is interesting also about sociocide and why we have, yes, to use this term. It's about the internal dynamics of sociocide, okay? Because, I mean, a lot of people talk about the wall. They said this is because of security, or this is because to take more land, or this is because transfer the population. But mainly for me, the wall is, the Israelis know their policy is creating a lot of anger inside the Palestinians. And the Palestinians are in, unable to export this anger toward the Israelis. So the wall, the main objective of the wall is to create a closed space where all this energy of anger destroy the Palestinians themselves. Yeah. Moshe Dayan in 1973, he said, and I'm quoting him, and it's not a well-known quote, I will create a situation where the Palestinians will rot, rot and stew by their own sources. This is sociocide. The other thing which also, it's how the Israelis 
eliminate our real leaders. The real leaders, the nationalist leaders, and through mass media, fabricating our leaders. I'm not talking about the small informers who give information. No, I'm talking about people who are forming policies. I mean, if today we are since 20 years going in a process which was clear even after a few months that it's going to nowhere, it is because we have non-nationalistic leaders. This is the important thing about also sociocide. I'm sorry, but just to finish, just to finish, yes, we have, we need this concept. There is a unique situation which you need, needs a unique concept. And our, our job is how to introduce this concept, you know, to struggle and to introduce this new concept in the jargons of the international law. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry about uh, mispronouncing your name. No, no. I, I, I get that all the time. No. I say my name is Nawa Kamid. Because it, it is and they, passport. Don't, don't, I mean, it is applied. I mean, no, I, I, say, I say my name is Nawa Kamid. That's my name. And I say, they say, well, what's your white name? I say, Dennis Banks, and the, and the, which is an Irish name. And I'm not Irish at all. So, <laughs> But that's what they call me. Uh, our next, uh, we have some questions from the juror. Uh, Michael, uh, Michael go first, Cynthia, uh, Stefan, Ronnie, and I will go last. Michael. Yes, I've got a question. What's the definition of apartheid under the apartheid convention? I mean, for me, apartheid is... No, sorry, not for you. I'm going to be precise. You've had the floor. I want an answer to this question, if you know it, since you've dismissed apartheid pretty well. No, I'm... Well, just, just answer the question. What are the terms, the definition of apartheid? No, I mean, two groups. excuse me, I didn't exclude apartheid. What no, sorry, I said, sorry, sorry, please answer the question. You've had a speech. What? No. No, no. I think the witness is I being mean. badgered here. Um, I'll give you an opportunity. There's so many questions that are here, and I've just been told that we I don't mean, have time. But may I just follow it up then, and we'll leave yes. that. Yes. The apartheid definition, I'll read out. Because what I want to suggest is that everything you said is included in an existing definition of a crime that can be pursued. The convention describes it as inhuman acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. This was something that this tribunal found against Israel in our last session. In addition, one further matter. The Apartheid Convention also prohibits and includes ethnic cleansing, specifically Article 2 BCD of the Convention Preventing the Crime of Apartheid. So all I want to say to you is that everything you've said is already there in crimes, I'm afraid. Okay, C can I answer? I mean, I will give you an example that, to show you that it's not there. In South Africa, the blacks were unable to swim with the whites with their beaches. But at least they have their own beaches. In Palestine, we are in, in the West Bank, don't have one meter on the Mediterranean Sea. We don't 
all Palestinians in the West Bank never went to the sea since 17 years. So this is different. I will. In, in Palestine, in Palestine, the, I mean in South Africa, I will tell you, I am from a town called Dilbira. Between this, between Dilbira and Bitin, is only one kilometer. In South Africa, the one kilometer will remain one kilometer. In the Palestinian case, we have to walk, we have to go 24 kilometers to arrive to the other village. <coughs> Another, to come here, I was unable to go through Lod Airport. A black was able, used to take maybe Cape Town Airport or Johannesburg. But as a Palestinian, I was obliged to spend eight hours in a journey to go to Amman. I am obliged to sleep in Amman and to, to come here. The time, the Israelis are occupying even the time even our ability to organize and to program our life. This didn't happen in apartheid. So we have a different, we have totally different, I am, can give no, I'm at sorry, least I'm sorry. 100, that... 100 examples why it's different okay. from apartheid. It's not different, it's different from South Africa. Okay. The point okay. I'm simply oh, okay. making. Okay, uh, Michael, Michael, because there are more people who want to speak. And uh, I'm the next person who wants to speak. <laughs> I would like to uh, attach my remarks as well, or join my remarks with our witness, Salah Abdal Jawad, um, because I'm not Scottish. My name was changed. And so, you know, I agree with our witness who happens to say that apartheid isn't enough. Because from my people inside the United States, I don't know what religion, I don't know what country, I don't know what region from Africa. I mean, there's so much I don't know about my identity. And I have a right to have my identity. So I had some more things, but I'll, <laughs> the chairman tells me I got to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Our next uh, question will from Stefan. No, 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 no. no it's um, Ronnie. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, and I admire your passion. And certainly, speaking to the audience as well, the um, tribunal has heard the passionate contribution and will discuss. So there's no prejudicial position here. But I do want to remind you, uh, and perhaps others in the audience, that when we use the term uh, Israel practicing apartheid, it's not that we say that it is identical at all. We're not saying that these are identical cases at all. And I agree with you in terms of some of the examples that you've been given about the majoritarian aspect of the indigenous people of South Africa, for instance, to the black majority, etc. The labor question in South Africa, apartheid needed black labor, and it's correct. In Israel, they do not want the Palestinians, and they would want to see the Palestinians totally, completely out of the question. But it's very, very important to understand that from the United Nations, the International Convention, the way apartheid is utilized as a concept is not that it's the identical case in Israel. In fact, and with all due respect to you, and I'm not criticizing you, we do see that the Zionists are the ones who accuse 
people who say Israel is, a za is an apartheid case. They say, uh oh, it's not identical. The Arab people in Israel are allowed to vote. Of course, that was never the case with black South Africans. So it's not that we say it's identical. There are a number of very important aspects that are different. Uh, it's the question in international law and the convention of international law of what the crime of apartheid is. And that's what we have to consider. We have considered this in Cape Town. We South Africans don't, are not the ones who say, oh, we must use this concept for Israel because we are chauvinistic, we want to use such terms. It's been Palestinians like yourself, it's been Israelis like Ilan Pape and others who have said, we see Israel practicing apartheid in a vicious form. When Archbishop Tutu and many others, freedom fighters from South Africa, who have gone to the occupied territories, for instance, or into Israel, we say, we see apartheid, and in fact it's much worse, and we do see that it's much worse. But I just want you to understand, we're not simply saying it's identical, we're looking at international law. Thank you. I mean, uh, about that uh, Arabs in Israel vote, this only related to Palestinians who are inside Israel. I was, I mean, describing the situation of the Palestinians in the, oh, what happened in 1948 as destruction and what happening to the population in the West, the West Bank. Let me just remind you that we have also something different because all Palestinians in the occupied territories since 1967 are considered not as citizens, not as second or third class citizens, but as residents. I mean, this is also, I mean, different from, uh, different and worse from the South African case. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, two more questions. Uh, Angela Davis. First of all, let me thank you for your testimony, and I would like to, uh, uh, I would like all of us to remind ourselves that we're not engaged in adversarial proceedings, uh, <laughs> that we are attempting to move towards uh, the moment when we can formulate strategies that will allow us to move forward in the defense of Palestinian freedom. And in that context, I would uh, like to perhaps uh, add to uh, what Ronnie said about the strategic use of the term apartheid. Um, and I'll say that when I visited Palestine, um, my uh, response was continually, this is worse than Jim Crow in the South. This is worse than apartheid. Uh, and so, Apartheid being a concept that has um, um, international um, resonance uh, uh, has been in part responsible for taking up uh, uh, the campaign, uh, the BDS campaign, uh, the Boycott, uh, Divestment and Sanctions campaign. And I'd like us to think about the strategic use of these terms uh, in the context of what they enable us to do. And I, I hope that in the last se session, we can um, talk very specifically about how to build on the work of the previous tribunals, uh, uh, the tribunal in which uh, apartheid uh, was discussed uh, uh, in relation to Palestine in, in Cape Town. And in all three of the previous tribunals, there was a call for uh, people to become more involved in the uh, BDS campaign. So I want us to uh, see the, the, these um, deliberations in the context of developing um, uh, action uh, 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 agendas, which is, I think, why we are doing all of this in the first place. Yes. Thank you. I'd like to uh, just make one comment. Uh, at the 1980 Russell Tribunal in Geneva, the word 
to describe the actions against Native Americans in this country was genocide. Um, and, but I understand now the, uh, another meaning of sociocide, and I think that um, both, uh, I think genocide is a lot stronger only because, uh, maybe because I've heard it longer, what, there's a complete massacre of an entire village and community and human beings. Whole tribes were wiped out. <coughs> so that's how I view genocide. And sociocide, of course, cultural, uh, the, the social conditions, um, it, both, of them, both of them apply to both of us. So, but I want to thank you very much for your presentation and for your strong words. Uh, by the way, are you in the movies over there too? Bravo, vous avez raison. Je vais